do thank you for all that we've just heard about our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for who he is, and we thank you for what he's done for us. Now, Lord, we do thank you for this time that we have uh, with um, Mr. Bradley here, and we pray, Lord, that you'd help him as he speaks to us, and that you'd help us, that we would hear. And we again ask that you give us wisdom from above. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Rob. Y'all weren't supposed to get that sneak peek there, just a little malfunction. Um, before we start uh, and get into uh, this uh, lecture on economics, um, something occurred to me, uh, and I was putting myself back in your shoes um, from a few years ago. Uh, if you would, I'm just going to read a, a quick verse from 1 Corinthians 8. Just a very quick, brief, simple verse. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. And <clears throat> what, I wanted, what I wanted to, to say to you today is you, you're getting a lot of knowledge. And if you get nothing else from everything else I've said, I want you to listen to this. And you heard, uh, you heard several men up here talking about it last night during the Q&A. We need wisdom. The knowledge that we're gaining here is not so that we can go out and beat our unbelieving friends and relatives over the head with it. It's not so that we can go and beat our Arminian head, friends over the head with it. It's so that we can serve others, as uh, Dr. LeGates has said many, many, many times. We're to glorify God and we're to treat others as we want to be treated. We're to serve others. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, um, he was writing to a bunch of messed up believers. If you read the, the first book of Corinthians, they had some major, major problems. But Paul deals with them lovingly, gently, bringing them along in the faith. And that's what I want you all to do with the knowledge that you're gaining this week. Deal with others lovingly, gently, humbly, bringing them along in the faith. Sharing the gospel, showing the light of the gospel to those who do not have the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. This isn't here to build up. We're not here just to build up our intellect. We need knowledge, but we need wisdom to apply that knowledge. Uh, and that's, that's what I want you to take away. If you take nothing else away from what I'm sharing with you. And let me, and I mentioned earlier, when I was in your place, when I was... Um, in college, I, I, was, um, I was reformed, and I went to a Baptist university, Bob Jones University. Great years. I mean, a phenomenal experience for me. Um, I was challenged there. I was encouraged to really study the Word of God by my roommates, by my friends, a lot of positive peer pressure. But I also went down to Bob Jones with the idea that I was going to go down there and I was going to teach them all kinds of great theology. And I had the wrong attitude going in. And it's taken me many years to look back and to realize that I went down um, and I was trying to beat everybody over the head with my superior theology. Now, we should all have the conviction of our, of our theology, of our covenant theology, of our reformed theology, we should have our conviction in that, but we don't take pride in that. 
we can have all of our theological eyes dotted and T's crossed. And if we don't have love, as the, as the apostle says in 1 Corinthians 13, I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. I'm worthless. Um, the, uh, some of y'all have heard me say this in 19, I believe it was 95, I was a junior in college. Um, Dr. Bonson preached or spoke at a conference down in uh, Atlanta, I believe it was at Chalcedon. And it was one of the last uh, addresses that he gave, public addresses before he, before he died. I wasn't there. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough. My, my dad was there. Um, he gave me tapes of the, of the conference. I'd love to go back and be able to get those tapes. Um, but in that, uh, one, of the, one of the sermons or one of the speeches that Dr. Bonson gave to that group of, of men and women who had gathered, he, was, he just implored them um, with tears to be humble because as Reformed folks, broadly speaking, most of us in here, not everybody, I get that, that's fine, but we tend to take great pride in our theology. We ha- I do believe we have the best and the most comprehensive and the, and the most scripturally based system of theology. But don't take pride in that. Take pride in the life, death, and burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. So let's talk about money. <clears throat> um, and uh, again, sorry for the, uh, the sneak preview. If you didn't quite catch it, I can say this. I'm a bankster. That's, that's what I am. I'm from the shallow end of the gene pool. Okay? Um, but, so, debt. So, I'm, what today, what I'm going to talk about is some basic personal finance stuff. Okay? So, we're going to get away from kind of high level theoretical economics. I'm going to get down to some brass tacks, some, some practical application for us. And I'm not going to go into a lot of depth, but I'm going to try to lay out some principles for you. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about debt. I mean, that's, I'm, in, I'm a banker. I make my living. I don't put people in debt. I lend money out. They put themselves in debt. I lend the money out. Okay? So, so there's some free exchange there. I'm not, I'm not indebting folks. I just get to try to collect on the debt. Um, so some, some principles about it. Uh, with, when dealing with debt, because it's, it, it's an important thing. Uh, it's a reality of life. Um, and it's, it's not always forbidden, but it comes with certain risks, okay? And it's a tool. You'll hear it referred to in the, in the financial realm as leverage. We all know what a lever is, and we take basic physics, um, you know, a lever can help you move large things. Leverage debt can be very, very useful in the business world. But as with any other tool, there are risks with using it. Okay, uh, and it's, those risks are particularly amplified in the consumer space as as individuals and as people, where there's not a business purpose for taking on debt. So I'm going to focus. I'm not going to go into the business side of things. I might touch on it, but just a bit. But I'm going to focus on the personal side of how we should look at money and debt and savings and how we should order our financial lives. So first of all, avoid personal debt as much as possible. Okay? Um, the foundation, the, the principle, and we'll refer to the Proverbs a lot. Proverbs has a lot to say about money. The Bible has a lot to say about money. We already talked about 20% of the Ten Commandments dealing with stuff and related to money. But the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. As a banker, I love that, right? Or a bankster, I should say. Um, the banks have the money. We lend it out. But as long as you owe the debt, to some degree you are the slave to the bank, the lender, whoever that happens to be. Um, You have an obligation to the bank, to the lender, to repay that. 
And until that debt is repaid, there is an obligation there that will bind you. So personally, personal debt, avoid it as much as possible. Um, in the, the reality in today, and, and uh, Dave Ramsey has a lot of great stuff to say. And I would highly encourage you, he's got some personal financial um, courses to take that you can take. Phenomenal. I don't agree with everything he says. I don't agree with any, everything that almost anybody says. Try to, try to agree with what God himself says. Um, need to do better at that, at my agreeing there. Um, but I would use his, his principles. Um, if, you don't, if you never take out personal debt, you will not hear a word of complaint from me. And I will give you uh, congratulations and kudos in that regard. Avoid personal debt as much as possible. Don't borrow to purchase consumables. This is one of the things that drives me nuts, okay? So um, I work for First National Bank of Tennessee. It sounds like a big bank. It's not. It's a little bank. Um, down in uh, our world headquarters in, is in Livingston, Tennessee. Population, I don't know, about 3,000 people. Um, but one of the things that, that, that we do there, um, and we've done it at the previous bank that I worked for, and most smaller banks or even big banks, uh, even the big banks, uh, they will make loans for people to buy Christmas gifts. And they'll go out and they'll make a loan for somebody. They're going to borrow, let's just say, $3,000 to buy Christmas gifts. And they'll put it on a three-year payback. So let's think about that. Approximately one year later, if my math is right, there's going to be Christmas again. Right? And then one year later, there's going to be Christmas again. So what's going on there? This is not a sustainable process. Um, and, and working with our folks, uh, we try to advise against that as much as we possibly can. Um, but it, it happens. Folks do that. Um, those are definitely, Christmas gifts are consumables. So you don't want to go into debt and pay for something that you're going to, so something else that's, uh, that, um, that, that folks like to do. Um, we, do, uh, we do some debt consolidation loans for folks. So those are typically loans where, um, where folks have gone out and they've uh, spent a bunch of money on credit cards, run up a bunch of credit card debt. Credit cards are very expensive. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. They say, you know, these credit card ex payments are too much. They're really high. They're really bad. So I'm going to consolidate my debt into a loan secured by my house. So what's on that credit card debt? It's your... Uh, it's your uh, breakfast. It's your coffee from Starbucks. It's your uh, uh, breakfast. Your breakfast burrito at Taco Bell. Um, it's all this stuff that you've consumed. So now you've gone and you've rolled it up into this nice smaller loan payment that you're going to pay off for 30 years. That's not that's not a good way to uh, uh, to run your personal finances. And I'm, I'm just going to speak bluntly here, okay? This is, if you have, if you've done debt consolidation or if your family has or whatnot, this is, it's not always a bad thing. But these are things that we need to think about as individuals and how we manage uh, our house. Remember going back to the, the derivative of the word economics, house rule. Uh, or as, uh, as um, I think I was talking with Pastor Warhurst, I'm going to start pronouncing it oiko uh, oikonomics. Oikos is, uh, is the word for, for house. Oikonomics. Um, if you're taking out a loan, don't focus, don't focus on the amount of the payments. That's one thing that bankers, car salesmen, other folks are really good at doing. They're going to tell you, hey, you finance this car, you finance this mortgage, this house. I can get your payments down to small dollar amounts. And you focus, oh, yeah, well, I can afford that $80 a month for whatever it is. Or I can afford that three or $400 a month for whatever it is. And you're not looking at the long term, the overall cost that's associated with that. Bankers, banksters are really good at doing that. Car salesmen are really good at doing that. We can focus on the payments as opposed to the actual cost that's associated with it. So if you're going into that place and you have to take out a loan, 
Don't focus on the payments. Those are interesting, those are interesting numbers. You need to understand those. But at the end of the day, that shouldn't be the determining factor of whether you enter into this transaction or not. And then, of course, my favorite point, always repay your debts, okay? Um, I wish that I had this verse on my desk in my office. The wicked borrows and does not pay back. And I'd stop it there just because I'm a bankster. But in the, in the first part of that verse is absolutely true. What separates, what is one of the things that separates the righteous from the wicked? The, the righteous borrows and pays back. But the rest of the verse, and we'll touch on this in a little bit, the righteous is gracious and gives. Okay? I'll say this. It's harder to be generous when you owe something else. Okay? It's harder to be generous when you owe and have obligations elsewhere. Um, so this next slide, this is, this is not going to be uh, for the folks that are, um, uh, that are, I guess we're not live streaming. But this slide, this next slide is not actually in the, in the slide deck that our folks in the back have. Um, because this just actually, this came to my inbox yesterday. I have some colleagues who are at a banking school this week and next week. It's a two-week banking school. Um, and they are in school down at Louisiana State University. And one of them is taking a, a class on debt collections. Collections, how do you uh, work out of bad loans? And uh, she sent me uh, this letter. It was a collections letter. Somebody was delinquent in their payments. This letter is from 1915. It's a little bit hard to make out. But it's from the Bank of Menlo. And I'm going to have to get over here and see if I can read this to you. A little hard to make out. So it says, um, let me see if I can make this a little, I might have to read it up here. Dear Sir, several days ago we verified, I'm sorry, we notified you of your maturing note. We have not received our money up to this date. We are enclosing another notice and ask that you Send us the money at once, or write us and let us know the reason why you are not going to pay the note. You never had, we never had much faith in you, <laughs> but thought surely you would, you would not sit still and see your mother sued on a note with you. <laughs> and this is just what we are going to do unless this note is paid in a few days. <laughs> I'm loving this. Any man that will borrow money and refuse to pay it back when it is due, and let his mother be sued along with him, ought to be shot on sight, <laughs> buried face downward in quicklime, so that every infection of the disease would be destroyed for, uh, forever. <laughs> and then it's signed respectfully, whoever it is. So. So, uh, you know, only in God's providence, in God's perfect timing, I received that yesterday. I said, you know, this is a sign. I've got to include this. And uh, I'm going to talk with our collections folks when I get back. And I said, this is going to be our new template for collections later, letters going forward. <laughs> All right, I said we were going to touch on credit cards uh, for a few minutes. Average credit card interest rate, this was a couple weeks ago when I was putting this together. According to Forbes, the average credit card interest rate is 24.12%. Okay, that's the average. Uh, they're higher, they're lower, 24%. Um, that's pretty high. They've been higher. Let's just run through a scenario. What does this mean? How does this play out? Okay, we said we don't finance consumables. Okay, so full disclosure, I have credit cards. I use credit cards. David Ramsey does not, says don't use credit cards. Uh, I do. Not promoting it, just saying that I do. Um, I also pay off my credit cards every month. So I'm not going to finance 
uh, short-term goods, dur uh, consumables on my credit card because I don't want to pay, I'm, I'm cheap, don't want to pay 24%. But let's just say, for argument's sake, we finance a big splurge family vacation and it cost us $5,000 on this vacation. I put it on my credit card because I can make installments over an extended period of time. 24.12%, I got the average interest rate. I've got decent credit, so it's an average interest rate. I make a minimum payment. I'll make 285 payments, and that, uh, that, uh, that vacation will cost me $14,332, okay? That minimum payment on your credit card statement, when you get a credit card statement, is not your friend. Okay? It's not your friend. It makes it look affordable. Oh, yeah, I can do that. It's not your friend. Uh, I don't have a slide on this. It just popped into my head. One of the things now that we're seeing um, in, the, uh, in the consumer space is buy now, pay later. It's very convenient. It's super. Everybody's using it on, um, for, from Internet sales and things like that. There, there are some things that are attractive about it because it's Generally, they're, they're generally no, there's no interest costs associated with it for you as the consumer. Okay? The merchant who is using that is paying the cost is essentially of carry because they're trying to move the inventory that they've got on their books. Okay? So they're paying the interest for you. Here's the challenge. Here's the problem. You go and you buy that pair of shoes uh, on Amazon and you use buy now, pay later, and you pay those shoes over four months. and your shoe, your, So the cost of your shoes is... 200 bucks and you make 450 buck a month payments, okay? You go and you buy something else and you put it on four payments. You go and you buy something else and you put it on four payments and these are smaller payments, it makes it easier to pay for it. It's not costing you interest, but what happens is you accumulate a bunch of small debts over time. Um, don't do that, don't do that, okay? Let's talk about when some of y'all will be, uh, um, some of y'all are married and don't yet own a home. Some of y'all are single and maybe you own a home, maybe you're looking to buy a home, maybe you're looking to get married, maybe that's why you're here because you're looking to find a spouse and you're going to buy a house. Houses are crazy expensive right now. They have gone through the roof. Um, lots of economic reasons for that. Um, not too long after I got into, uh, well, I guess it was about nine or ten years after I got into banking, we had this thing called the Great Recession. Uh, it was a nightmare for um, bankers like myself and for home builders and for a lot of people. It was terrible. But what happened as a result of that was people were making building houses and selling houses and flipping houses, and there were way too many uh, houses that were built and there was a crash that, what, that devastated a lot of banks and a lot of builders. Um, and since that time, there's not been a lot of houses built. And as a result, among other things, um, uh, there's a sh relatively, there's a shortage of houses, and so prices are going up because we're trying to, uh, the market is basically rationing houses. There are more people that are demanding houses, needing houses, because uh, population uh, has, has grown. But when you get to that point of buying a house, more likely than not, most of us will finance that house, okay? And that's fine. Uh, I, I am not saying you just got to pay cash for a house. But if you go and you go to the bank and you talk to your banker and you talk to your realtor, they're going to say, we can get you a payment as low as X number of dollars. So a $200,000 loan on it, it's an 80% loan on the $250,000 house. That's, that used to be a really nice house. Four or five years ago, that was a really nice house. Today, it's tough to find anything under $300,000. At least in my neck of the woods down in, in the middle of Nowhereville, um, Sparta, Tennessee. But if you finance that house at an average interest rate today, over 30 years, which is what everybody tends to do. Not everybody tends to, uh, not everybody does. That's the, that's the default. Everybody gets a 30-year mortgage because your, your rate is, interest rate is going to be fixed for 30 years. You know what your payment's going to be. You can budget around that. That $200,000 house 
you're going to pay $280,000 in interest on that house over the next 30 years. You're going to pay more than the price of your house in interest over, if you finance that over 30 years. Now, hey, I love that. That pays my salary. I love it, okay? I like seeing $280,000 in interest coming into my bank. Um, but I don't want it coming from you guys. Okay. What I would say, here's, a, here's an option. Let's look, at the same, let's look at the same loan, but amortize it over 15 years. It still ain't cheap. You'll pay $124,000 in interest, less than half. If you finance that house over 15 years as opposed to 30 years. Um, a much better proposition, still not cheap but you're still helping to pay my salary. I like that. Uh, my kids like that because they've grown accustomed to eat, eating. But um, here, here's an option. Here's, here's a real life option for you. Um, say, say you want to buy that house. When you're buy, looking to buy a house, you don't need to keep up with the Joneses. House, this is, this is contrary to popular opinion. A house is not an investment. Do not view your house as an asset. Because let me tell you something. It's expensive to own a house. Your house does not earn income for you. Investments earn income for you. Your house is a money pit, okay? You gotta pay taxes. You gotta pay insurance. You've got to pay for maintenance and upkeep. You've got to get a lawnmower, you've got, or you got, and then you've got to mow the grass, or you've got to have kids to mow the grass. Um, your house is not an investment, okay? Um, one, an option that you can do is you can go into and buy a house, finance it on a 30-year loan, but budget and be very disciplined in paying it off in that 15-year time frame, okay? gives you some cushion on your payment because you're paying it off. Your, your required payment is lower because you're theoretically paying it off over, over 30 years. But you accelerate your payment and you pay extra every month to save on that interest cost. And that way, if you have an unexpected bump in life, you lose a job, you have a medical emergency, something comes along, gives you some cushion in your payment so you could drop back for a short period of time and pay just the regular, regular payment. That's an option, that's a strategy. Uh, but I would strongly advise against doing a 30 year loan and just making your monthly, minimum monthly payment. If you can do something faster than 15 years, more power to you, keep going. But a, but a 15 year interest rate is, is a fairly standard product and um, can be, can be worked, uh, worked on. We don't want to be that guy. We don't want to be the minion. Whew. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about saving. I've switched up my slides just a little bit, and, um, because obviously the, the opposite of, of debt is well, not exactly the opposite, but we want to, We want to be able to save. We want to be like that righteous man who pays back his debts, but we also want to be able to be generous. So before we save, we give, right? We need to be reminded regularly that um, everything that we have comes from God. And he gave us two things in life that are binding upon us, that um, are lasting principles, that remind us that everything that we have comes from him. One is the tithe, and we'll talk about that. The other is the Sabbath. Our time is from God. Our stuff comes from God. We give him one day in seven. We give him a tenth of everything that we have. Malachi 3, 8 to 10. Will a man rob God? Uh, rob God? You're robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with the curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, 
And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. We don't tithe so that God will bless us. Okay? We tithe because it is our duty and it's our privilege. It's our, it's, it's our privilege to give back to the one who has given us everything. But look at how gracious and merciful God is in that Malachi passage. I give you all this stuff. You give me 10% back. And you know what I'm going to do for giving me back some of what I've already given you? I'm going to pour out my richest blessing upon you. What amazing grace that is. <clears throat> Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things that you should have done without neglecting the others. So the, the tithe is, is timeless. It's binding. Jesus didn't do away with the tithe in the New Testament. I've heard some folks make that argument, that we don't have to tithe anymore. That's an Old Testament thing. Jesus here is saying, yeah, you tithe the, the, the dill, the mint, and the cumin, but you're forgetting the weightier things. You're going through the motions, and you should have done that. You should tithe on these things, but you're neglecting the spiritual things, the ultimate things. So when we tithe, we don't reject the tithe or neglect the tithe. It's still required of us. And then uh, just as far as um, uh, Hebrews goes, that's, that's when uh, Abraham pays a tithe to Melchizedek. See, that's before God gave the law at Mount Sinai. That's very early on, and we see that, that Abraham humbles himself before the priest of Salem and gives a tenth of everything that he has to him. The tithe is a, bindless, binding, is a timeless principle. We, we touched on that. Um, yeah, and we need to trust in the Lord from whom all these things come and not in the stuff that he's given to us. We don't trust in the stuff that he's given to us. Um, biblical principle is that work and labor is required of everybody. Um, I, I, used to, uh, I used to serve with, uh, with several folks uh, as a deacon at Westminster Church here in Kingsport. Um, there was, a, there was a case uh, several years ago before, before uh, we moved down to Middle Tennessee. Um, and we had, uh, that, that particular Sunday, we had a gentleman guest speaker fill the pulpit, Dr. Ralph Borsma. Um, Dr. Borsma is, he's blind. But he got up and he preached. He's also the professor of an international theological seminary that ministers to the Portuguese-speaking people. Dr. Borsma stood, stood up there in the pulpit as a blind man and brought the word of God to us. Ironically, providentially, let's put it that way, and it was a, a jarring juxtaposition for me, we had, a, we had a couple of folks that had come in off the street that, that Sunday uh, and were looking for assistance. And so uh, me and one of, the, one of my fellow deacons, we met with this couple. <clears throat> and as we always did before we provided any kind of financial or any kind of assistance with folks, we, we interviewed them. We talked with them about, you know, their family. Uh, is, do they have family? Do, are they working? This, that, and the other. Just trying to get a feel for those folks, what their spiritual condition is. Well, the, 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 the husband, I think he was married, the husband of this couple said that, no, he wasn't working because he, was, uh, he was on disability because he had an injured toe. And so he was unable to work. And I was struck. Here was a man who could not work, who was collecting a disability check, who had just sat under the preaching of a man who was blind 
serving him, this man who refused to work. Um, so, confession. I often get cynical when I deal with people like that. And I need God to work on my heart to give me compassion for those folks. Okay. The biblical principle uh, is work. So, you know, and God is gracious in the way he deals with his people. In Leviticus 19, 9 and 10, he lays out some laws for caring for the poor. He says, now when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. God, God is pr providing for the poor, the needy, and the stranger in the land of Israel. But it's not a handout. It's not a handout. The command is, if you're able-bodied and you're able to work, go out and work hard and glean from the fields. And, and notice, this is the hardest part of the work. This is the, around the edges. This is where the stuff that the, the primary harvesters have dropped. This is hard work. But he also, it's also, God commands, from the, uh, the, the owners of those vineyards and from those fields, don't go back a second time and pick up all that stuff you dropped. It's valuable, but leave it for the poor. Let them gather it up. Let them work and earn it. Proverbs 16, 26, a worker's appetite works for him. His hunger urges him on. One of the problems that we have in, in the United States today is, is um, Marvin Alasky wrote a great book many years ago, highly recommend it to you, called The Tragedy of American Compassion. We have, um, as Americans, in the name of compassion, we have perpetuated um, um, laziness and actually poverty. Uh, and, and it's done in the name of compassion. Uh, and I would, again, highly recommend Marvin Alasky's book to you. Um, but the idea that uh, that work, uh, a man's hunger, um, his, his stomach works for him. And then just another verse, a couple of verses, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 12. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, not according to the tradition which you received from us. For you yourselves know how, how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat of anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working day and night so that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we did not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in a quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Um, and, and notice, so this is, this, is, this is speaking to me here. He is saying that there are believers in the church that are not working, right? If you're, if, you're, if you're in this position, or if we know folks that are in this position that are, that are refusing to work for their meal, don't, as is my tendency, despise them, reject them, have compassion for them, instruct them, bring them along in the faith. It's hard work. Bring them along in the faith. Help them to grow in the knowledge of the Lord and how we live our lives in the knowledge that we are saved from uh, a life of, from, from an eternity of death and hell. Have compassion on our fellow brothers and believers who find themselves in these situations and on those who are outside of the church who find themselves in this situation. We want to bring them into the body of Christ. Let's 
see all kinds of interesting signs. Uh, if you ever go to Nashville, uh, if you can't make that out, it says a supermodel out of work. Um, so charity and giving is not to be indiscriminate. We already kind of touched on that just a little bit. Um, it's easy to throw money at things, to throw money at people, say, hey, yeah, here's 20 bucks, go, go away. But what's the real root problem with folks that find themselves often in this, in this position? Charity should be done with knowledge, with discernment, with understanding, with wisdom. Um, open, just before this lecture, we're talking about wisdom. That's what we need when dealing with the poor. We don't want to perpetuate bad habits. We don't want to perpetuate um, poor life choices. So handing, handing the guy on the corner a $20 bill uh, and saying, God bless you, is not ultimately helping. Okay? Be wise in how we provide charity to those around us. Providing charity is critically important. For, for us as believers. And we have a particular obligation to help those around us. So we're also commanded to plan and to save for the future. <clears throat> Proverbs 13, 22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. We don't want to be like Gru, right? We don't want to be like Gru. Um, so we want to store up and save up an inheritance for my children's children, for our children's children. So how do we do that? Save a little each money, save a little money each month, and at the end of the year, you'll be amazed at how little you have. That's one way to look at it. But there's this, this really interesting phenomenon. And I'm told I've never really seen, I don't remember seeing the quote and I don't have it referenced. But this, uh, this idea of time value of money. Uh, I think Albert Einstein which is attributed to have said something along the lines of the time value of money is one of the top some odd number of uh, um, wonders of the world. So a number of years ago, a friend of mine, uh, David Green, who's an attorney here in the Tri-Cities now, uh, we were having a conversation. We said, what would have happened if Enoch had given Methuselah uh, some money and told him to invest it? All right? So we're going to go through this example. And I love Excel. I, lo I love the tool Excel. I'm a nerd. I love it. And it helped me to come up with this next scenario. I said, so what happens if Enoch gives Methuselah some money and he invests it and he's able to make a 5% annual return? So he gives him a penny. I can. Thank you. So Enoch gives Methuselah a penny when he's born. And he invests it. <clears throat> is a penny saved, a penny earned? Well, here's what happened. This is thanks to the power of Excel and the power of compound interest. This is what happens at each of Methuselah's monumental birthdays. At 10 years old, he's got two cents. By the time he's 300, he's got uh, $22,000. By the time he uh, has his 969th birthday, if you want to count the zeros there, and if you're questioning, that is approximately $3.4 quintillion on a penny at 5%, okay? 3.4 quintillion, and that's annual compounding. Okay, that's not monthly compounded interest. That's not daily compounding. That's one time a year that interest compounds. It's basically earning interest on your interest. Okay? To give you an idea for how big that number is, and it's really it's interesting, but it still doesn't capture it. 
Here is 2022 world gross domestic product. This is the value of everything produced in the world in 2022. Here's Methuselah's penny. All right? So, so there is the time value of money is really impressive. We, 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 we understand that he died in the year of the flood. We don't know if he died in the flood. Timing's important, though, okay? Uh, and I don't think anybody here is going to be living 969 years. Um, but there's some principle here, right? What I'm trying to get to is we can save and we can store up money value for our children's children if we're not spending it all today. And why would we want to save up for our children's children? We talked earlier this morning about uh, the inputs in an in economic system, land, labor, and capital. We want to be able to capitalize our children and our children's children so that they will have resources to use for the betterment of God's people and for the betterment of his fel our fellow men in the future. Okay? We're not saving just for the sake of saving. How does this work for us? Okay? You're not going to live 969 years. You're not going to live anywhere close to that. Um, so this, this example, it's a little bit of a busy slide, but what I'm trying to get to is how can we save and how does it impact our future and what we can save for our later years and for putting our children um, to, to save up for our children's children. So one of the principles of, of saving is you want to start early, okay? Start early. If you're in high school, you're in college, the income, the income stream is pretty uh, meager. Make an effort after you tithe, make an effort to put some of whatever you earn aside and save. Okay, in this example, uh, this first column is, hey, I'm a poor college student, I'm a poor high school student, I'm gonna wait 10 years, I'm gonna kinda get a little, little uh, get, get my feet under me, get a car, do this and that and the other thing. I'm gonna wait and start saving for the future, my retirement, whatever it is, I'm going to wait 10 years. So you wait 10 years, uh, you put in $1,000 finally after 10 years, you get a 6% interest rate, you leave it invested for 30 years because approximately that's when you would theoretically be, and we can talk about retirement, that's a different issue, we're not going to go into that. Uh, you invest $1,000, in 30 years that's worth $6,023. That's decent. What happens if you had invested that today? or save a little bit and invest it. Start now, start saving now, and put in $1,000, never touch it again, that's worth $10,957. It's worth a lot more to start early, okay? Uh, so here in this column, you wait 10 years, but then you put in your initial investment, and then you invest monthly $83, that's about $1,000 a year, and at the end, you've invested thirty-one thousand dollars, and in uh, twenty sixty-three, uh, what is that? Forty years from now, you've got eighty-nine thousand dollars, almost ninety thousand dollars. If you start now and continue saving, put in a thousand dollars in today, invest a thousand dollars a year for the next forty years, you'll have one hundred and seventy-six thousand dollars. And then finally, if you wait ten years and then save double every month save $167 a month trying to make up for lost time for those 10 years. If you save that for 30 years, you'll have $179,000, approximately the same amount as, as this number. So graphically, this is what it looks like. The blue bar is the amount that you've invested, that you, of the amount of money that you put in, that you saved. The green is the earnings on those assets, okay? So I said earlier, your house is not your asset. The house is not an asset, it's a money pit. It's not going to make money for you. It may appreciate in value, but it doesn't make money for you. So when I'm talking about investing, I'm talking about stocks, bonds, I'm talking about real estate, I'm talking about other things that actually produce a return, okay? So let's talk about some of these things. We already touched on this. Start saving early, save consistently. As you're able to, Increase your savings over time. Uh, one of the things that I would encourage you as you get your job and as you get a promotion, 
take a significant portion of the increase of a, of a raise that you get and put that aside. Put that aside and save, okay? Have goals. What are you saving for? You know, you may need to buy a new car. You may need to be buying a house. Um, you're saving for your children's children to leave them an inheritance, okay? Enjoy God's blessings. You don't just save, save, save and never spend, okay? That's contrary to Scripture, and we're going to see that in just a moment. Don't hoard. That's kind of, you know, that's the, the, the Mr. Scrooge, the Scrooge McDuck. You know, you see him diving into piles of gold. He's just got all this gold. He's rich, but he doesn't, he, all he enjoys is swimming around in his gold coins. Don't trust in our wealth. We tr tr trust in the God who gives us our wealth, right? That's fundamental. Don't trust in our stuff. And be generous, okay? I'm running out of time. I'm talking too much. <clears throat> We're commanded to enjoy God's blessings. And this is from Deuteronomy 14, 22, 27. It's fascinating. You shall surely tithe all the produce that comes from what you sow, which comes out of the field every year. You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God. If the distance is so great for you that you're not able to bring the tithe, since the place where the Lord your God chooses to set his name is too far away from you, when the Lord your God blesses you, then you shall exchange it for money. You may spend the money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink or whatever your heart desires, and there you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. Here's a, here's a again, amazingly gracious God that we serve. He blesses, he gives. This is this has often been referred to as the rejoicing tithe. Okay, there are multiple tithes in in Old Testament, but this particular one is a command by God to take the blessings that He's given to you and have a party with it. This is this is the vacation. This is the feast. This is Thanksgiving. God wants us to enjoy physical blessings, physical abundance as a foretaste of the eternal blessing, the eternal abundance and provision that he makes for us. It's a foretaste of that. Don't be stingy. Enjoy the blessings that God has given you, but don't blow it all on this rejoicing. Enjoy it, but this isn't all there is to it, okay? Splurge from time to time, but remember who it's coming from, and remember that it's a gift of God. And remember, my life is good, real good. God gives us a good life. He gives us a good life. Not that we're not going to face persecution or hard times, but God is gracious and merciful to us, and we have much to be thankful for and rejoice in. Okay, Oof, I'm going to have to, uh, how am I doing on time? Where's Rob? What time do I need to quit, Rob? Like right now? <laughs> okay, give me, can I have five minutes? Okay, five minutes. I'm going to blow through this. Sorry, guys. Um, Actually, let me do this, because I hate to cut into your break time this afternoon. I'll cut into it tomorrow. How's that? Um, I'll take some of these slides, and I'll uh, transpose them, because I was going to get into the money side of things. Um, so I'll just put that in tomorrow's slide deck, and we'll, uh, we'll pick up from there. But I do need to share this with you. Let's see if I can do this. Very quickly. Just because we've only got one more lecture, all right? We've only got one more lecture. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Thank